you've heard all about the RTX 4090. It's next-gen performance, high power consumption and steep price. But no matter what your opinion about Nvidia's new flagship might be, I can guarantee that once you know the true dimensions of this GPU, you will see it in a different light. Before we start our journey into the heart of the 4090 and take a closer look at the 8102 chip powering it, I want you to try and guess how much bigger you think this new chip really is. And no cheating, don't look it up. Compared to the 3090, are we talking about 50% more transistors? Maybe even twice as much? And how do you think it stacks up to Nvidia's previous generations like Turing or Pascal? If you don't have the slightest idea, no problem. Just go with your gut. Leave a comment down below with your guess and let's see who gets it right. Now lock it in and let's reveal the true size of the chip behind the 4090. Nvidia's RTX 40 generation is fueled by an unprecedented amount of transistors. And while the increase over the previous Ampere flagship is already crazy, with an unbelievable 48 billion more transistors, the most incredible part for me is that older generations like GP102, which powers the amazing 1080 Ti, almost seem insignificant compared to the absolute monster Nvidia has created. In this video, we will not only explore how Nvidia was able to design such a huge chip, but also what all these new transistors are used for. We will take a look at the hardware configuration and the memory system, discuss Nvidia's strange approach to power efficiency, and discover that the 4090 is actually using a heavily cut down version of the AD102 chip, leaving room for much more powerful graphics cards in the future. Without further ado, let's take a look at the huge chip inside the RDX 4090. According to Moore's law, the amount of transistors used in computer chips doubles roughly every two years. If we take another look at the transistor chart, we can see that Moore's law seems to be in trouble. One might say Moore's law is dead. With the release of Ada Lovelace, which offers a 2.7 times increase in transistors over the previous Ampere generation, Moore's law is getting an infusion of new life. The question is, how was Nvidia able to accomplish such a massive increase in transistors and why couldn't previous architectures achieve a similar generational leap? To answer this question, we first need to take a look at process nodes transistor density and die size. Nvidia is what we call a fabless semiconductor company. It means that while Nvidia does design their own hardware, they need a foundry partner to produce their GPUs. Aside from the GPU architecture, the process node has a massive impact on basically every single aspect of the chip, from performance and power efficiency to how dense transistors can be packed and as a result, how large the chip will turn out to be. By comparing the process nodes of each GPU generation with the corresponding transistor density and die size, we can explain the generational leaps. On this slide, we have Nvidia's five most recent flagship GPUs. Starting with Maxwell, we can see that Nvidia targeted a transistor increase of around 50% Gen on Gen. From Maxwell GM200, which powered the 980 Ti Pascal GP102, used in the 1080 Ti has 47.5% more transistors. Turing-based TU102 used for the 2080 Ti increased the transistor count by a hefty 57.6%. Ampere GA102 used for the 3090 Ti has 52.1% more transistors. And finally, Ada Lovelace AD102 powering the RTX 4090 takes the cake with a 169% increase in transistors. But the die size of the chips show very little fluctuations. Three out of five GPUs are slightly above 600 mm squared and only Pascal and Turing show a significant deviation, which can be explained by the fact that Pascal made a rather large jump in process node technology from TSMC's 28 nanometer process to a much better 60 nanometer process node. On the other hand, the TSMC 12 nanometer node used for Turing was in fact only a slightly refined 60 nanometer process with a new marketing name. 
resulting in a very similar transistor density for two generations in a row, with the same density but more transistors Turing had to increase the die size. Instead of comparing the abstract nanometer designations of each process node, the transistor density is a much better point of comparison. From Maxwell to Pascal and Turing, we can observe close to double the transistor density. With Ampere, Nvidia made a temporary switch to Samsung's 8 nanometer node, most likely for cost reasons, as Samsung offered much lower prices. Back at the time, Samsung's 8 nanometer process offered a decent increase in density over TSMC's 16 and 12 nanometer generation, but lagged behind TSMC's new competing 7 nanometer process node. Finally, if you look at the transistor density of TSMC's new 4 nanometer node used for Ada Lovelace, it becomes clear how Nvidia was able to increase their transistor count this much. A typical generational process node jump from Nvidia would have been from TSMC's 7 nanometer process node to TSMC's current 5 nanometer node. But since Nvidia did use Samsung to produce Ampere, which meant they had to work with about 15% less density on last gen, and now is making the jump to a further improved 4 nanometer process, the gen on gen improvement is closer to the increase you would get with two full node jumps. And Nvidia is clearly taking advantage of this huge improvement in process technology, using a 2.8 times increase in transistor density to produce a chip with 2.7 times the amount of transistors. And with that, we have the answer to our first question, how Nvidia was able to achieve such an enormous boost in transistors with Ada Lovelace. The new process node just delivers a unprecedented increase in transistor density, and instead of using it to design a smaller and cheaper GPU, Nvidia went all in and designed the huge AD102. But answering this question leads directly to our next question. What did Nvidia use all these extra transistors for? And why hasn't performance also increased 2.7 times over Ampere? If we compare the hardware specs of the 4090 with the previous flagship, the 3090Ti, we can see that the 4090 has 52% more shader cores, 52% more texture mapping units, and 57% more render output units. But these numbers are far from the 2.7x increase in transistors. So where did all the transistors go? There are three parts to answering this question. First, the RTX features of the card. Second, the memory system, and third, GPU binning. Let's start with the RTX features. With the launch of the Turing RTX 20 series back in 2018, Nvidia started to introduce ray tracing accelerators into their architecture to enable real-time ray tracing in games. And it didn't stop there. Nvidia also introduced tensor cores, which are needed to run AI upscaling technologies like DLSS. These new hardware units have dedicated tasks and are not part of traditional rendering process. Especially, the tensor cores are only active when running DLSS and most reviews run benchmarks without upscaling tech. A 52% increase in tensor cores, especially combined with the implementation of improved and probably larger forge gen cores, does use a lot of additional transistors but does not immediately impact performance. It's the same with the ray tracing cores. While they do improve ray tracing performance, they have to be scaled up with the rest of the GPU or ray tracing performance would drop off. So by introducing all those extra features, New NVIDIA architectures have to exponentially increase their transistor count compared to older non-RT architectures. So by introducing all those extra features, new NVIDIA architectures have to exponentially increase their transistor count compared to older non-RT architectures since you also need to scale up ray tracing and tensor cores. This will only increase in the future and even if NVIDIA's next-gen GPUs fall back to a 50% chen-on-chen increase in transistors, Based on Ada Lovelace, that's almost 40 billion transistors, more than an entire RTX 3090 Ti. In a nutshell, there are large parts of Nvidia's architecture that are not directly involved in improving the gaming performance. Or if they do, as in the case of RT cores, they just didn't even exist three generations ago. And with each generation, these parts get larger and use up more transistors. Next up is the memory system, or rather Nvidia's version of Infinity Cache. Most reviews did not cover this area very well, which is odd since it's a major new addition to the Ada Lovelace architecture. If you look at the memory system of the 4090 and compare it to the 3090Ti, it's an odd sight, since both GPUs use the exact same memory setup, 24GB of 
21 gigabytes per second GDDR6X on a 384 bit memory bus and as a result slightly above 1 terabyte per second of memory bandwidth. How is the 4090 able to perform 60 to 70% better than the 3090 Ti with exactly the same memory bandwidth? The 4090 should be severely limited by this. It's only when we take a look at the L2 cache that the solution becomes apparent. Just like AMD, Nvidia has implemented a large on-die cache. The implementation is slightly different since AMD's Infinity cache is a so-called last level cache and does not replace the L2 cache while Nvidia just increased the amount of L2 cache. But the result should be similar, a higher theoretical memory bandwidth and increased energy efficiency. Keeping the data on the die itself is transistor intensive but consumes much less energy than accessing the video memory. With the 12 fold increase in L2 cache, we have found another reason that explains why the AD102 chip comes with such a large increase in transistor count. Next is GPU binning, which is a process that involves finding and salvaging chips that have partial defects. Not every AD102 die produced by TSMC turns out to be perfect. On the contrary, for such a large chip, a defect is bound to happen more often than not. But instead of throwing away every chip with a defect, which would finally justify Nvidia's pricing, quality control works to figure out which parts of the dies are affected. The defective parts are then disabled and sold as bin versions of the GPU. That way, one single chip is used in different products, for example, a flawless ultra high end version with no defects, chips with slight defect rates right below that, and heavily bin parts at the bottom. If done right, basically every chip can be used, decreasing waste. To figure out how much a specific GPU has been binned, all we need to do is look up the theoretical maximum amount of cores and then compare it to the active cores in the retail product. Going back in time, the 980 Ti used 91.7% of the available shaders on the GM200 die. The 1080 Ti increased that to about 93.3% of the GP102 die and Titan XP used the full chip. The 2080 Ti used 94.4% of the TU102 chip with the Titan RTX again being based on an unbinned version. The 3080 Ti used 95.2% of the GA102 chip and the 3090 Ti is using the full die. In light of these numbers, the 4090 comes in a bit low at only 88.8% of the full AD102 which is the largest bin for a 90 class card so far, even below previous ADTI cards. With over 10% of the GPU not being used, over 9 billion transistors on the RTX 4090 are disabled, including 24 megabytes of the new L2 cache. That's more disabled transistors than the Maxwell generation GM200 chip even has, which powered the entire 980 Ti. Think about that, more than an entire 980 Ti just disabled transistors on the 4090. And with that we have found the last piece of the puzzle, explaining where all the extra transistors on the AD102 die are hiding. Some are used for parts not directly impacting gaming performance. The 12 fold increase in L2 cache uses another large chunk of transistors. And finally, the 4090 is based on a quite heavily binned version of AD102, limiting its performance potential. Of course, all of the factors combined are only part of why a 2.7 times increase in transistors does not equal a 2.7 time increase in gaming. No architecture scales perfectly, but we can clearly see how not every new transistor improves gaming performance. If you made it this far into the video, leave a comment down below. I'm interested to see who's watching all the way. First rumors of the RTX 40 generation painted a pretty grim picture, mostly focusing on insanely high power consumption numbers. Even just a few months ago, we got very credible information from AIB partners that Nvidia is planning a 600 watt version of the 4090. Some remnants of this can still be seen in the huge aftermarket coolers on partner cards. I have to be honest, I was positively surprised by how efficient the 4090 turned out to be. Not only did it deliver almost 70% more performance, in a lot of gaming applications, the 4090 uses less power than the 3090 Ti. It's currently the most efficient GPU on the market if you look at performance per watt numbers. But a lot of reviews noticed that the TDP of the 4090 is unnecessarily high. And even with a power limit reduction of 30 to 40%, the card only loses a few percent of performance. Reducing the TDP by 100 watts down to 350 watt, Performance is only reduced by a mere 3%. Even going down to 300 watts, the 4090 still performs within 10% of the default 450 watt TDP. 
Nvidia has clocked the 4090 very close to its theoretical limit. Basically, what you would have seen in OC models from AIB partners in previous generations is now the default. And the last few percents of performance always has the highest price when it comes to power consumption. I can, for the life of me, understand Nvidia's decision to release the 4090 with a 450 watt TDP. I'm sure Nvidia knows very well that at just 350 watts, the performance is largely similar. Releasing the 4090 at a lower TDP would not only have made a better impression, but the cooling systems wouldn't need to be so big. The power delivery could be less complex, and there would be no need for the new 12-pin PCI Express Gen 5 power connector. Basically, Nvidia could have released a much better version of the 4090, but they choose not to. And no one can tell me that Nvidia thinks that 3% more performance are needed to win against AMD's upcoming RDNA 3 GPUs. We just talked about how the 4090 is using less than 90% of the 8102 die, leaving room for a stronger 4090 Ti or Titan class card. I can't offer you any explanation as to why Nvidia chose 450 watts, because I can't understand it myself. But if you should own a 4090 at some point in time, you can drastically improve the card by just setting the power limit to 70% and enjoy a much more efficient, cooler and quieter card with literally the same performance. The Bauer made a really interesting video about it. I will put a link in the video description below. Next, let's talk about the price of the 4090 and the future of the 8102 chip. When it comes to pricing, ironically, the RTX 4090 seems like the most sensible Ada Lovelace offering so far, which doesn't mean it's a good deal. The 4080 16GB, based on the smaller 8103 dime, has seen a huge $500 increase in MSRP over the 3080. Instead of $799, the 4080 is supposed to launch at a staggering $1199, an insane price level for an 80 class card. And the 4080 12GB was so bad that Nvidia had to unlaunch it. It's most likely coming back as a 4070 or 4070 Ti at a lower price in the future. So for just $100 more MSRP over the 3090, the 4090 does seem like a good deal when compared with the other Ada Lovelace GPUs Nvidia has announced so far. The price is obviously so high that most gamers will never be able to afford one, but not only is it currently the fastest card on the market by a long shot, there is also no doubt that the 8102 chip is an expensive piece of hardware, with over 600mm2 on TSMC's latest 4nm node. Combined with 24GB of fast memory, a huge cooler and beefy VRMs, the bill of materials must be sky high. This is not to say that these prices are not supporting Nvidia's high margins, but for Nvidia's current Halo product, it's not bad. It does offer even more performance per dollar than the 3090 Ti. What kind of irks me as a hardware enthusiast is the larger than usual binning of the 4090. If I'm spending north of $1600 or more than 2000 euros here in Europe, I want the best and not a car that's using less than 90% of its potential. But that's just my personal point of view. I think it is safe to say that Nvidia will release a card above the 4090 at some point in the future. The RTX 6000, which is Ada Lovelace for professional users with 48GB of revamp, might be an indication of what's to come. It has 18,176 cores and thus almost 2,000 more than the 4090, so a decent increase in performance is likely. A 4090 Ti would still retain the 24GB of RAM, but I think the configuration of the RTX 6000 is likely what we will see for a 4090 Ti. Even more perfect would be a competitive RDNA 3 generation from AMD which could put pressure on current GPU pricing. The 4080 needs to come down to at least $900, preferably lower, and the 4070 should be in the $500 to $600 range, in my opinion. AMD will reveal RDNA 3 on the 3rd of November, which is in less than two weeks time. If you are planning on buying a new GPU, I would wait until we know more. It will be quite interesting to see if AMD's modular and space optimized architecture will be able to compete with Nvidia's huge monolithic monster of a chip and of course, we will do a complete architecture comparison here at High Yield once all the information is out. I am interested in your opinion on the 4090 and the chip powering it. Do you think Nvidia made the right choice by going big and what aspect of the 8102 do you find most interesting? Plus, how do you think RDNA 3 will compete? Leave a comment down below, I am always looking for your input. I hope you enjoyed this video, if you did, you know what to do and see you in the next one.